in many ways as, as, let's say, animals, we depend for our response to things on our perception of threat. And that therefore, threat and risk is absolutely, and the psychology of risk is absolutely fundamental to climate change. We could say in evolutionary terms, there's a range of qualities that things have which really trigger uh, what John Adams would call the risk thermostat, the point at which we, we move into, automatically start to move into various forms of action. These are all really concerned with proximity, things we can see, things that are close to us, things which uh, are happening immediately, um, things which have a causality which is readily understood, and preferably a clearly external enemy. So, in other words, the perfect fight or flight response would be someone coming at me with a knife. It's like, I can see them, they're threatening me, it's happening now, and so on. Well, of course, needless to say, when we look at climate change, we actually have something that you could say is in many ways perfectly designed to confound our immediate risk and threat assessment process. This therefore means that when it comes to climate change, our perception of risk or threat has to be generated. And it leads us into the world of belief. This word belief is actually one of the ones which is consistently ignored from the dialogue on climate change. It continues to be treated as a, as a technical issue where all that is required is for the information to come down the stream, we weigh up that information, then we create a rational opinion. However, as we know, and as you all know very well, belief and the psychology of belief is vastly more complex than that. And that belief is actually socially constructed from a number of components. We do have a set of internal ethics, we have a sense of ourselves, who we are and how we relate to the world, and then we feed new conditions into that. When we see a contradiction between the information and our internal ethics, of course, we may seek to resolve it by our response to that condition, or we may seek to reframe it. It is, I think, again, unique amongst the problems we face because our individual role in this problem can be quantified down to a very accurate level. Major ethical challenges like whether they, are, whether they are personal ones or whether they are global ones are extremely hard to quantify and usually impossible. I don't know, for example, my role in landmines in Cambodia. I know because of a way that the market system and politics works that somewhere along the line some of my money is going somewhere towards this or political decisions being made somewhere on my behalf which might be influenced by my voting decisions and so on. But I can ethically detach myself from this issue. Climate change, as indeed your carbon, your walk the walking the walk carbon thing, or indeed any kind of carbon calculator will tell you, can in theory, your personal responsibility and impact can be measured down to the last gram. That makes it a very interesting and unusual ethical challenge because I can say very clearly, if my emissions are 10 tons and your emissions are 5 tons, my contribution to this problem is twice as great as yours. So it is very unusual to be able to weigh it like that. It therefore poses a very particular ethical issue. We have to reframe it in order to avoid responsibility for our own emissions. Norms are fundamental for climate change and climate change behavior. Our entire attitude towards climate change is mediated by social norms. We are constantly looking and checking at the people around us to see what their attitude is, both towards climate change and towards the behaviors they take. And although in theory, the final one, behaviors, is something which is generated by our knowledge, again, behaviors are constantly influencing our value sets and influencing our attitudes. We could say, here's a problem, climate change, I had better change my behavior on the basis of it. It is also just as likely we could say, here's my behavior. This appears to be out of sync with climate change. I will therefore change my attitude towards climate change in response to the behavior patterns I already have. A very interesting piece of research, there haven't been many, done into the psychology of climate change, was done in Norway by Kerry Norgard, asking the question how it was people in a small, Norwegian town, dependent on the ski industry and fishing, who were very well aware of major changes compared with the historical norm of climate change, how they were dealing with climate change and how they were processing that information. Here was her conclusion, which I find extremely interesting. She found that, the, that in her words, the denial of climate change that she found there was indeed socially constructed, as she says here, through a process of social interaction. 
In other words, that although there was a very high level of individual awareness of climate change, they had somehow collectively reached an agreed compact that climate change would not be talked about. So I'd say one of the key social strategies, probably the most important one, is a collective agreement that is outside what we could say the norms of attention. This is something we're not going to talk about and not deal with. As indeed any of you will know if you try and raise climate change at a dinner party, so. As, it, as indeed uh, Mayor Hillman, author of How to Save the Planet, found to his uh, cost when he raised the issue at a dinner party as to why it was that everybody was flying everywhere. And as he told me, then what happens is, because they were all talking about they were all well off professional people who are enjoying pensions and, and, and enjoying the chance to travel, maybe, you know, first time in their lives travel a lot. And he suddenly hit the roof and went on at great length about kind of like climate change, how serious it is, if you've got any idea what you're doing. And there was total hush. <laughs> Fell over the dinner party. Nothing happened, nothing happened. And then someone said, my word, what a lovely spinach tart. <laughs> and I call, this now the, I call this now the spinach tart strategy. <laughs> what he also says, which was very interesting, also kind of reflecting that, of course, this was a, a social strategy, is what then he said when people spoke for the next 10 minutes about the spinach tart. In other words, how delicious it was, could they have the recipe, how wonderful, where did you get that spinach from? It's absolutely lovely. Therefore, the way that we frame it in terms of saying this is within our acceptable grounds for discussion or is not is one of the key ways which we frame climate change. Kerry Norgard also said something which is going to be a theme of what I'm saying. I'm quoting, she said that the, the people in this town in Norway, it appeared, used, I'm quoting here, a series of interpretive narratives to deflect disturbing information and normalize a particular version of reality. She said, her conclusion was that knowing or not knowing appeared to be a political act. In other words, first of all, people made the decision whether or not they would know about it. And that's very clear in terms of people's responses. But also, this thing, interpretive narratives. And I'm going to keep coming back to this because I think this is key. What I find very interesting about this is you can then put this alongside a similar quote from a different context. Professor Stanley Cohen talking here about how social groups respond to institutionalized human rights abuse. He came to a similar conclusion, that, that there was a social compact, a social agreement, again, the norms, the norms of attention, what could be talked about, that decided these things would not be talked about. Everybody knew them, and they would be excluded. I just want to flag up for you here. There are very interesting similarities and compatibilities between how psychologically, as a society, we are dealing with climate change and how as a society, we have dealt and continue to deal with things like human rights abuses. Very strong bystander effect, very strong tendency to submerge ourselves in diversionary activities. Um, very, strong, very strong tendency to develop excuses in the anticipation of, of being future challenges. In other words, the anticipation that at some point in the future someone will say, you knew about that, why didn't you do anything? And people actually prepare their arguments and internal moral justifications in anticipation of that. This is part of the thing about like, knowing or not knowing being a political act. People, in my view, make the decision they don't know anything about climate change. You know, it, would take you, it would take you five seconds on the internet to get pages of information on climate change. Ignorance is not, is not a defense in terms of the fact that the information is hard to come by. It is a defense in terms of people defending their own moral integrity against this information. It is a personal decision.